Three Eye Atlas. It's just getting weirder. Hey, everybody, Rex Bear Leak Project. How the heck are you? So I've been researching Three Eye Atlas since the public knew about it. Like I was one of the first people to report on it after Professor Loeb. And I'm fascinated with this incredible object, whatever it is. And so I've had several guys on the show talking about the electric universe cosmology. And I've had my friend Greg Allison on the show, which is a rocket scientist. Uh, he's, he's super brilliant. And he actually did some calculations of the trajectory of 3i Atlas, very similar to Professor Loeb. You know, he's an aerospace engineer. And um, I almost thought I had it figured out, especially when I had the EU guys on, because we were able to explain the anti-tells and the changing of colors and, and several anomalies that have been listed. If you follow the EU cosmology, electric universe cosmology, you can say, oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. It makes total sense. But you know what doesn't make sense? This is really cool. So when 3i Atlas went past Jupiter, or I'm sorry, not Jupiter, when 3i <laughs> 3 Atlas went past the sun, it actually changed trajectory just a slight amount. And there was a lot of speculation. Is this from technology? Is it just because of the, the, the nature of the electric universe and the object itself? But here's where it gets really interesting. These minor adjustments that 3i Atlas made around the sun is now putting it extremely close to the Goldilocks zone of Jupiter, where the gravity is to where if it was technological, it could actually release specific, I mean, what would you call them? Scout ships or drone ships or probes to observe Jupiter. And this is very, very interesting. We've also got new images that are from the ground. Um, there's a gentleman by the name of Paul Craggs. We're going to look at his latest imaging from a ground-based telescope that you can get for about five, 600 bucks. It's a smart telescope, pretty good images. And then we're going to look at Ray's uh, astrophotography, Ray's photography. He's got some good images. And I'm going to share with you some imaging that wasn't released from NASA during their... Um, let down during the big letdown and everybody was really excited. And, and by the end of the presentation, people were falling asleep and they tried. Well, did they, I mean, I don't know, but we'll talk about that later. I don't want, I don't want to knock on those guys and gals because I think they were given the presentation as best as they could, but they're scientists, you know, they're, they're, they're teachers, they're astronomers. They're not really entertainers per se. So we can't be too hard on them. Thank you very much for being here, everybody. It's great to see you. And uh, let's let's talk about this. So reading some of the comments, got, I have some great comments in here and have some uh, ridiculous comments in here. Like usual, there's always one in the bunch at least. So relax, man. We haven't even started yet. We've just started. Let me show these to you. The first article, though, that I wanted to go over with you was from Professor Loeb. A fascinating discussion about this theory of technological possibility. So an extraordinary new anomaly of 3i Atlas. This gets really, really cool. Let us suppose hypothetically that the interstellar object 3i Atlas is a mothership that was designed to see Jupiter with technological devices. That would be the largest distance from Jupiter that this interstellar gardener should arrive at. Or what should be the largest distance from Jupiter that this interstellar gardener should arrive at? For that purpose, 3i Atlas must arrive within Jupiter's radius of gravitational influence. The so-called hill radius inside of which Jupiter's gravity overcomes the gravitational tide from the sun interior to the radius Jupiter's gravity wins over the sun's gravity and can keep low speed orbiters bound without the sun ripping them away. The Lagrange points L1 and L2 of force equilibrium are located at the hill radius and are ideal locations for technological satellites since orbital corrections and fuel requirements are minimal there. So basically what he's saying is that there's this location on the outskirts of Jupiter that would be ideal to launch some type of probes or some type of spaceship to track and study Jupiter where the gravity would be ideal. So another way to explain this is 3i Atlas is passing Jupiter on the 16th of March at a distance of approximately 53.445 million kilometers. Now, 
He computes Jupiter's hill radius, which is the sphere within which Jupiter dominates the sun's gravitational influence. And for that date as 53.502 million kilometers. So the near coincidence of the two distances, objects closest approach, the hill radius, is described as extraordinary or a one in 26,000 odds event, according to Professor Loeb's calculations. Loeb speculates the three-eye atlas is technological in origin rather than purely natural, then its trajectory might have been fine-tuned via non-gravitational acceleration so as to approach the hill sphere. He cites measured non-gravitational acceleration of 5 times 10 to the 7th power astronomical units a day that altered its trajectory enough to bring it to that boundary. So basically what he's saying is when this thing passed the sun, it moved just enough. It its orbit, its trajectory moved just enough to where now it is going to be at an ideal location to probe Jupiter. And it was almost at that identical location and distance when it passed Mars. He also raises the hypothesis that three Atlas could be a mothership or vehicle designed to seed Jupiter with technological devices, perhaps because Jupiter's hill sphere is a stable region for technological payloads. He also goes further suggesting that if human spacecraft later find unnatural satellites around Jupiter that we did not send, this might imply extraterrestrial intelligence had interest in Jupiter's domain, and by implication, our solar system is not the target of attention. This one right here, I think, is really interesting. So in other words, the non-gravitational acceleration introduced a small course correction of exactly the magnitude needed to bring the minimum distance of 3i Atlas from Jupiter to the value of Jupiter's hill radius. 3i Atlas would have missed the edge of the hill sphere otherwise. So if it was on its if it was on the original trajectory that we observed and that we calculated, it would have not, it wouldn't have, it would not have gone to this location called the hill sphere. This suggests that the level of non-gravitational acceleration was finely tuned to result in and bring 3i Atlas exactly to the radius of Jupiter's gravitational influence. If 3i Atlas is technological in origin, it might have fine-tuned its trajectory with the help of thrusters so as to arrive at Jupiter's hill radius. In that case, the multiple jets observed around 3i Atlas in its post-perihelion images, which we can see right here and right here, might have been used for the slight orbit correction needed to result and the optimal time for any such maneuver is close to perihelion when a spacecraft can take advantage of the gravitational assist from the sun. In addition, 3i Atlas arrived at perihelion while being hidden from behind the sun for Earth-based observatories. We therefore do not know whether it just maneuvered slightly to satisfy or also release technological devices near perihelion. Statistically, this is rare, and it is a coincidence between the values of minimum D and H, a margin of 0 0.06 out of 53.5 million kilometers corresponds to a coincidence of one part in a thousand, but given the full diameter of Jupiter's orbit around the sun, the coincidence amounts to one part in 26,000. Wow, that's pretty cool. This is from Paul Craig. This is his X page. And this is 3i Atlas. Now, he's using a $600 or less, what's called a smart telescope to track this with 30 second exposures. So if we look at the object here, tracking 3i Atlas, and let me show you what he's using. He's using a Dwarf 3 smart telescope. They're about 500 bucks. I am not affiliated with Dwarf 3 in any way, but I think it's interesting. I might actually get one. I've got a Mead 8-inch telescope right now, which I would say is superior to this as far as how far I can see in the, the, the details. However, one thing really cool about the Dwarf is, the Dwarf 3 is how portable it is and how it's kind of like a smart telescope. It's just plug and play, basically. You tell it what to do and it'll track stuff for you a lot easier than traditional telescopes. But that's what he is using to track this object. Whereas NASA is getting about $25 billion a year in funding and we're not, I mean, where's the beef, right? We already talked about that. 
So these are some images and folks, I'm not saying this is alien. So if you're like in the chat going, Oh dude, Oh, you're a conspiracy theorist. Oh, you don't know what science is. Like I read this one guy's comment, um, on the podcast that I did with diamond from Oppenheimer ranch project and David drew that does a lot of electric universe cosmology and podcasts for the Thunderbolts project. And, um, I said, Hey, you know, let's, let's go where the data goes. And, and they shared with me a bunch of information and I'm like, yeah, yeah, I think you guys are, are probably right. That makes a lot of sense. And he's in the chat going, Oh, Rex, I feel sorry for you because you think everything's an alien and you don't understand anything. I said, well, I feel sorry for you because you didn't even listen to what I had to say. Cause I never said it was an alien and I did understand what they said and I did follow the EU cosmology. So I'm just putting that out there because there's trolls out there that have like these internet trolls that are just they're like, they're mean and they're mad and they don't listen to things. And they post anyway. So enough about that. I digress. No, 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 no. This is the object that I thought was really cool when he, when he did the stacking and such. So it doesn't seem to have much of the tell. You can see what looks like the coma and you can see what looks like the, the egg shape that we see in other images that have been shared. Um, from, you know, like the Hubble telescope and a lot of the, observatories around the world where they have big money and millions and millions of dollars of technology. It's pretty similar. I would say that um, for a $500 telescope, this guy did a really good job picking up 3i Atlas. So way to go, man. Nice work. Um, this is from Ray's astrophotography. I think he's doing a great job as well. He's getting hundreds of thousands of views. He's got his telescope. He's tracking this thing and, and he's sharing the information with the world. Um, he did do a podcast previous to this that said something along the lines of he, he was observing the comet orbiting or like rotating. And he said that that wasn't natural or something like that. It is natural. That, that is actually 100% normal to see an asteroid move in that fashion. So anyway, or comet to move in that fashion, but great imaging, as you can see right here, this is an image and this was just a day ago. So definitely subscribe to his channel. I'm subscribed. I think that's pretty cool. When we look at the stuff that NASA's released, actually, let me pull this up real quick. I want to show you something. So I did a little bit of uh, brightening here. Let me pull this up. And just so you know, um, if you're getting two notifications for the live streams, it's because we're doing vertical and horizontal. So if you've got a phone and you're watching on your phone, you can get the vertical uh, version, or if you're watching on your TV or on your computer, you can get the horizontal version. So somebody was commenting in the last post, Rex, you got two live streams of the same thing. One's vertical, one's horizontal, and you can actually live stream through YouTube now, vertical and horizontal. So if you're watching it in vertical and you want to watch it in horizontal, just jump on over to the other stream or vice versa. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so, buddy. You go ahead. Um, here we go. Sorry, I was just commenting on a, another comment in the comment section because people are amazing in there. The internet trolls are lovely. Check this out. This image right here. This is from Ray's astrophotography. I just tightened it up a little bit and this is what he picked up. Pretty cool. I think uh, there was another image. If we looked at some of these other images, from 3i Atlas, they were using the same quality telescope that I have, an eight inch telescope, and they were getting some really, really good imaging from it. But I was gonna pull, I was gonna pull this up right now for y'all. Let's remove this and let's bring this up. Thanks everybody. Even, even you, Mr. Tro. All right. So these are the, there's a lot of images that weren't released during the NASA press conference. They released a few of the images, but not all of them. So these are some other images. And if you just go to science.nasa.gov and type in 3i Atlas, you can pull up all of the images that they released from different technologies and satellites. We've got Soho, we've got the Maven, we've got the high rise. This is the punch. And then the Maven's ultraviolet instruments. So these aren't images of the objects that what they're doing right here. I saw somebody post this and say, look what 3i Atlas looks like, man. No, th this is just an ultraviolet image composite of the hydrogen atoms surrounding comet 3i Atlas. And there's more surrounding Mars, hence the more intensity that we get right there. So 
Anyway, I'm just absolutely fascinated with this, this um, most recent anomaly that Professor Loeb pointed out. And, uh, you know, I think the best researchers are those that follow the data and they don't make up their mind automatically and they don't uh, brush something off as a conspiracy or laugh at somebody because they have alternative information, especially when you, you look at that information and you can't explain it. Can we explain the changing of colors? Yes. Can we explain the anti tells? Yes. With the electric universe cosmology, we absolutely can. Can we explain these traject this trajectory? I don't think so. I think that there's still something missing there. So I just wanted to bring this to your attention and thank you very much for watching. I hope you have a beautiful day and be excellent to each other and check out my coffee here. Is that tripping you out or what? Oh yeah. It changes with the screen. Have a beautiful day, everybody. And be the change you want to see.